Yes, before the sun sets, I gotta let them know. Let's go. Come on. It's been a long time coming. Yeah. Wake up, stop the dawn. Uh -huh. The tide is turning and it's calling me. Time. It's time we turn our hearts back to him. Back to him. It's been a long time coming. Long time, y'all. Wake up, stop the dawn. Wake up. The tide is turning and it's calling me. Uh -huh. It's time we turn our hearts back to him. Back Thank you for joining us in our study of the book of Genesis. Today we're in Genesis chapter 8, and we've been looking at the life of Noah. We've seen that Noah, he walked with God, Noah was a friend of God, and Noah pleased God. So God called Noah to build an ark. This massive construction process, it took over a hundred years. Then we saw that God called Noah into the ark along with all the animals. They go inside and then God, he sealed the ark. There was this seven-day waiting period, and then the flood came. And the ark was lifted up, and the waters, they continued to rise. And the ark, it went through the flood waters for 150 days. And we have Noah and his family as they were safely protected in the ark. Now, I want you to recognize the typology that we have in the salvation of the ark. The first thing that we must recognize is that the ark was planned by God. God is also the one who planned our salvation. The second thing I want you to notice that on the ark, there were not two doors, not three doors, not five doors. Nobody went into the ark any which way they wanted. There was only one door and Jesus is the only door to God. So Jesus says, I am the door. No man enters the father except through me. So salvation is through Jesus Christ alone. And there are no other doors to heaven. The third thing we see here is that it was the ark alone that saved mankind and saved God's creation. We also see that it's through Christ's death that mankind is saved as well. We see that the ark saved Noah and his family from the wrath of God's judgment. We also see that Christ has saved us from the wrath of God's judgment. Another important thing that took place that before the ark was the life of Enoch and Enoch was raptured before the flood. By this, we see that Enoch wasn't protected through the flood. He didn't go through the flood. And we see that his life wasn't fully lived out because God took Enoch prior to the judgment that came upon the face of the earth. And Enoch was a typology of the church. The church doesn't go through the tribulation. So what we see is that the church is called out of the world before God deals with his judgment and his wrath is being poured out onto the earth. And from the scripture and typology, we see a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And for those that believe in mid-tribulation, we would have to see Enoch raptured during the flood and maybe get wet up to his knees. But this is not the case that we see. And for those that believe in post-tribulation, then we would have to see Enoch raptured after the flood and the waters subsided. So the reason why I point all this out is because God is very concerned with typology. God is concerned enough with typology that it costs Moses from entering into the promised land himself. That's how concerned God is about it. And you'll remember that Moses, he was asked to smite the rock one time and the water would come forth and it flow out and Moses he lets his anger get the best of him and he smites the rock two times <laughs> and then he calls forth water. But you'll see that the rock is a typology of Jesus Christ and Christ wasn't smitten twice. He was only smitten once. And the action of Moses in building out the typology was now destroyed by his disobedience and the consequence of that disobedience was no small slap on the wrist. After Moses led the children of Israel for 40 years in the wilderness, he was not allowed to cross over the Jordan River and enter into the promised land. So when we see Enoch raptured, 
before the judgment comes. This is a typology of the church being raptured before the tribulation comes as well. So next we see that Noah and his family, they didn't get raptured, but they went through the tribulation. And they are a typology of the nation of Israel. Israel and the Jewish uh, remnant are the ones who are going to go through the tribulation period. And it'll be the tribulation that is going to open the eyes of the Jews to the fact that Jesus Christ is in fact the Messiah. So here we begin now in Genesis chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, where it says, Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the ark, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. <clears throat> and the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. So it says that God remembered Noah. This doesn't mean that God forgot about him, but the Hebrew word for remembered here, it means to begin again to act upon someone's behalf. It means that God began to act on Noah's behalf. And what does he do on behalf of Noah? Well, God starts to do three things. First, he suddenly causes the winds to pass over the earth. The second thing God does is that he stops the fountains of the deep from erupting. And he closes the windows of heaven. He stops the rains as well. Then God, he steps in and he stops the judgment. And he then prepares for Noah and the animals to go forth on the earth. Verse 4. Then the ark rested in the seventh month the 17th day of the month on the Mount of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So Mount Ararat is located in Turkey. And it says that the ark rested on the 17th day of the seventh month. It's interesting that the scriptures is so detailed on when the ark came to rest. And what's interesting is that the 14th day of the seventh month is Passover. And it's the seventh, 17th day of the seventh month is actually three days after the Passover. Now, when you see that Christ was crucified and then three days later he resurrected, and it happens on the very same dates within the Jewish calendar. And all of this is a foreshadowing of the crucifixion of Christ during the Passover. And then three days later is when salvation comes to all mankind through Christ in his resurrection. So it's a perfect picture of God's plan here. And what day does the ark set back down again? into the newness of life upon the earth? Well, it's on the very same day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So as we study the scriptures, we see an incredible typology that's taking place here. And when we stand upon the word of God, we're standing on a sure foundation. We're standing upon the truth and we are on the right path. Verse six. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark, which he had made. Then he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out for himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. And she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. And he waited yet another seven days. And again he sent forth, he sent the dove out of the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And no one knew that the waters 
had receded from the earth. So he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him anymore. So here in verse six, it says, so it came to pass. And if you've been around the block a couple times in life, you too have experienced many storms. But storms have a way of passing, don't they? Storms will come to pass. And if you're facing a storm or a trial in your life right now, this too shall pass. One day you'll be able to say, and it came to pass. So be encouraged in your storm as it is only a season. So now Noah, he sent out a raven, it says, on the 264th day from the beginning of the flood. Then Noah sends the dove out on 271 day after the flood. And then we see that Noah sends the dove out again on the 278th day. And it returns with an olive leaf in its mouth. Seven days later on day 285 from the beginning of the flood, Noah sends out the dove once more and we see that it doesn't return. I want you to see that the dove is a picture of of the Holy Spirit. As the dove went out of the face of the earth and the Spirit went out over the face of the earth, there was no place for the Spirit to land, so it returned. And in the same way, the Holy Spirit goes out looking for a place to land in people's hearts and in people's lives. The Holy Spirit is looking for room. And if we're open, if we're desiring to be led by the Holy Spirit in our life, then the Word of God tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, that the eyes of the Lord go throughout the earth looking for a person in whom he might show himself strong. And my question is, does that describe you? Is there any area in your life that you desire for him to be strong in? Is there any area of weakness or maybe an area that you have not gained complete victory in in your life, that you're struggling in or you're stumbling over? Is there any area in your life that you need the strength of the Lord in? The Word of God says that when we are weak, He is strong. And did you know that God will allow you to fight your own battles as long as you want to? He's so patient and He'll wait until you call upon him. We serve a mighty God. We serve an able God. And his desire is to be gracious and merciful in our lives. And he desires that we would surrender our struggles and that we would surrender our weaknesses over to him. That he might show himself strong in our lives. And so a raven and a dove went out from the ark and Noah reached out for the dove Noah reached out for the Holy Spirit. Verse 13. And it came to pass in the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, that the waters were dried up from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and indeed the surface of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. So here we see that Noah waits 29 more days until New Year's Day. 314 days from the beginning of the flood until he finally removes the covering of the ark. And then he waits 57 more days before he goes out of the ark, giving a total of 371 days after the flood started. 317 days is exactly one year and one week or 53 weeks. And now there's new landscape. The landscape was different prior to the flood. The oceans are much more extensive on the face of the earth. And the land now only covers a third of the earth's surface. Now there's wind and rain and hail making the terrain unfriendly. Another thing is that lifespans are going to decrease rapidly from this point on. Verse 15. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, every animal, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth according to their families went out of the ark. It's interesting that when Noah opened the door, he doesn't immediately leave the ark. I know that on road trips, I can't wait to get out of the car and stretch my legs after about five hours or so. So Noah, he's in this ark for almost one year. And the door opens up and he doesn't go out. That's kind of awkward, isn't it? I mean, there's a reason for this. It's not just that he doesn't feel like getting off the boat, because I'm sure he did. But you'll remember something. Where was God's presence? It was inside the ark. And remember that God, he called Noah into the ark. And if Noah has had this fellowship and intimacy time with God, to depart from the presence of God and to go out to the land, Noah wanted no part of that whatsoever. He would rather stay with God in a sheep pen filled with smelly animals, <laughs> enjoying the presence of the Almighty, than to have all the delicacies that the world has to offer. And we see that Noah desires the presence of God over anything else. And Noah will not leave the ark until the Lord actually tells him in verse 16 to go out of the ark. And we see that he was commanded to go. After all this amazing time of intimacy and fellowship and communion with the Lord. After being saved by the Lord and enjoying his presence. And he wants nothing more than to remain there in this state of communion. But he's been commanded to go out into the world. I want you to recognize the amazing typology that's being portrayed here. We see Jesus saying, come unto me all ye who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. And we see the invitation of Christ to come in and to fellowship with him, to enjoy communion with him, and to come into his presence. And after we've rested in his presence and enjoyed intimacy time and fellowship with him, then what does he say to us? Go. Go ye therefore into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And so we see the same invitation to come and the same invitation to go. Lord says, you go and take with you that love. Take with you that intimacy and that relationship that we've shared and take it to the entire world. That was the very thing that the world had been lacking. It was lacking the communion and fellowship with God. So the wickedness that was on the face of the earth that wanted nothing to do with God, <laughs> this is what brought the judgment to come upon the face of the earth. And we also see that the animals, they're going to go forth and they're going to repopulate the earth as well. Verse 20, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So Genesis, you know, is the book of first mentions. And this is the first mention of an altar here. Along with that, an offering of thanksgiving and sin offering is mentioned here as well. So the sin offering is for the propitiation of sin. That word propitiation, it means the turning away of wrath by making an offering. So a burnt offering represents total consumption, a total consumption. It's when you consume the entire offering and give that to God. And we see here that it's an expression of ongoing obligation to a complete sacrificial life to God of self-surrender. And when Noah comes out of the ark, this is now uh, this dedication of himself. The burning up of the old life. There's this complete surrendering of self to God presented here in the burnt offering. So it's interesting that this is his first action as he comes out of the ark. Noah was commanded to go and to serve God. And the first act that he does is he worships God. And so it is that before we go and serve God, we are to worship God. It's important, this concept, this truth in our lives, that we are to be worshipers of God. 
We must be worshipers and not just during a worship service because it's out of worship of God that we are built into the men and the women that God will use in our lives to serve him. So God, he can't use somebody that's not worshiping because they're going to be operating in their own flesh now, in their own strength. So this is where we're changed and this is where we grow, which is in the worship of God. And let me just say that if you're not growing, if you're not seeing yourself move forward, the first thing I would ask is, how is your worship life? People might say, well, I study the word of God. And it's good that we study God's word. But are you worshiping God while you're doing that? Or is it just to satisfy a daily quota or just to gain Bible facts? Because it's easy to come to the word of God just for an intellectual exercise. And then you can see no change in your life whatsoever. You can go to church. You can... Uh, start knowing what the pastor is going to say even before he says it. You can memorize scripture in Greek and in Hebrew, and you could be the greatest Bible scholar that there is, and yet see no transformation in your life whatsoever. Ever. So the truth of the matter is that we must be worshipers of God. And I just want to add that the heart of worship, it comes from thanksgiving. It's out of a grateful heart that we can truly worship the Lord. So we need to be thankful to the fact that we're not going to get what we deserve, which is how. We've been given mercy and his amazing grace in our life. And we need to get that into our brains and down into our hearts. And we need to worship the Lord in all that we do. It's like, thank you, God, for not giving me what I deserve. Thank you for giving my, my life back. And Lord... Thank you for saving me from the consequences of sin and the pit of hell. And so Noah, this is what he did. He worshiped God and he offered a sacrifice to him. Verse 21, and the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for, for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. So he says that the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. By nature, there is nothing good inside of man's flesh. And even though God realized this, he continues to try and reach us. While the, while the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So God promises that as the seasons continue to change and as the sun rises and the sun sets on the evil and on the good, he will never again destroy everything in earth until the judgment day when Christ returns and destroys evil forever. So as we look at the story of Noah and the ark, there's some tremendous lessons that we can learn from all of this. First, we must be men and women who plan ahead. You have to remember that when Noah built the ark, it hadn't rained yet. Uh, Noah planned ahead and he built the ark. The second lesson is don't listen to critics. Just do what needs to be done. The next thing is that the ark was built by amateurs and the Titanic, it was built by professionals. So listen to God's directions. The last lesson is for us to stay fit. Because when we turn 600, uh, someone might ask us to do something big. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us here in this study of Genesis chapter 8. I hope it's ministered to you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.